Are folk in here for the seminar, the workshop? Yeah. Could you move this way a bit, though? That would be real. Nigel. Well, perfect. You can, you're perfect. I'm very happy with you watching football. As the current chaplain of Port Vale Football Club, I am uh, very happy uh, that you're watching football at the same time. Just don't jump up or cheer or... <laughs> that'd be helpful. Uh, so if you could grab a seat, that'd be great. We will make a start in one second or two when the slides appear on the screen. Yes, because I'll be doing introductions and all kinds of things, so take your time. <laughs> People are only allowed to go and get a drink if they bring me one. That's the... Uh, <laughs> I think I've run out of little vouchers things now, so I'm struggling. Oh, no. Time just cost a shot. <laughs> We're all right, then. I'll be in there in about 40 minutes. Okay. Afternoon, everybody. Yay. Um, I was asked for a title for a workshop, and um, I, I wasn't given much of a, a, a clear steer on what they wanted, so I kind of reflected on that phrase that I guess all of us in church leadership have heard over lockdown. I'm looking forward to getting back, which grated on me every time I heard it, but you will have heard it as well, because um, what are we getting back to? We recognize, many of us, that what, we, what was happening and what we were doing before lockdown was failing. So why do we want to get back to something that was not working? Maybe this period gives us a chance to do something different and to reflect, as many have reflected, uh, on doing something different and moving us forward. Um, so I, uh, I took the title, Bringing People Back or Moving People Forward. What is... Because they are options. We can, we can get back to doing what we were doing before and continue to see decline, church closure, failure. Or we can go, this is the time to do something different. And what is it that we can do? What are the trends that are emerging out of pandemic that we can kind of uh, think about, reflect on, uh, and take as part of our own journey? I use this quote this morning really quickly, uh, Mark Twain's uh, quote, uh, the rumors of my death are grossly exaggerated. Actually, in some of our contexts, they're not grossly exaggerated uh, because the, the reality is, I, I live in, currently in the Staffordshire Moorlands, um, so I live in a place called Leek, which is the Staffordshire Moorlands area. The, the Methodist circuit in the Staffordshire Moorlands at its last circuit meeting agreed to close four churches post-pandemic. The... the the rumours of their death are not exaggerated, they are reality. Um, but, having said that, this morning I was hearing uh, in the workshop I did just before lunch of a story from Crew, where they're making members as a result of pandemic because of some of the amazing ministry they did in pandemic and they've connected with new people in a very different way. So, so the church is still here, the church is still alive, the church is still growing in many places, but the reality is we will experience the stories of growth and death as we journey forward, and both will be reality for us. Yes, there's a hand in the air. If you're speaking, you need a microphone because we're online, so welcome to those that are online with us in this workshop. That's great, and we will have conversation together, so when we do have conversation, those of you that are online, if you feed in your thoughts and reflections and questions, I'll make sure they're picked up as we journey on. Marcus. Thank you. This is more than a question. It's a matter of saying to you all who are watching online and um, all of us who are here that on behalf of the circuit, we would really love to say thank you to Ashley. He didn't know that was coming. It just, it's just uh, uh, a week to say thank you for all that you've really taught us today and how Cliff has been in our lives as a circuit. So we look forward to hearing and staying in partnership with you. So on behalf of this circuit, we would like to really offer you our love and our sense of appreciation and gratitude coming from Coffee Shop Sunday. And I want you all to put your hand I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> uh, coming from Coffee Shop Sunday here in Coventry and Nuneaton Circuit. Ashley, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Um, so, please do, if you've got questions at any point, throw a hand up. If you've got a, a comment to add in. Because as I said this morning, I had my 15, 20 minutes to just tell you stuff this morning. Have you not got a workshop this afternoon? 
Come, Pete, come and join us. <laughs> um, so I've had my 15, 20 minutes to throw some stuff out. What I want us to do this afternoon is to stop over each comment and just see how that kind of resonates with where you are and what you're thinking and the particular churches. What I would have loved to have done, but we don't have time, so maybe just... Um, you may all be in the same place. I won't do this. It would have been helpful to me to hear the kinds of churches that you're currently coming from um, and how things are for you post-pandemic. Uh, what, what's happening in, in your church context? Who's, what are the numbers like? What's the feel like? What's worship feel like? So maybe just a couple of people would, could tell us and maybe online it'd be helpful to hear uh, just a little bit about how things are for you. How, are you back in a church where everyone's come back? Is, is it staggered? Is it staged? How are things going? A couple of people maybe just share about where you are, what, what church is like. You were putting your hand up then. Yeah. Hold on, I need to give you a microphone. Nigel's going to run with the microphone. He's watching football as well as running with a mi- microphone. <laughs> this is hybrid life in action. Football, microphone and engaging in a workshop. Marvellous. Hello, I'm from Nottingham. Our church, not everybody's gone back to church now, even myself has only decided this week that I might go back. Um, I find online, for me, I feel better. I did say to my church, when they put the chairs back to normal, I will then contemplate going back, but not as it is at the moment. Can you give me a reason why? Because in our church, like, we had a service. I did go to one service, so we all was distancing. And then when we were waiting for coffee, we was all sat on tables together, chatting, people were pulling chairs up. So to me, you're defeating the object then. So you're not bad because you feel unsafe? No, I'm happy to do that. Okay. But what I'm saying is, Sorry. why distance in church when in coffee, we're just all sitting okay. together, okay. talking, chatting, round tables, people pulling chairs up? Okay. Anybody else want to tell us about how things are in their context? David? Uh, thank you. I don't, uh, I don't have a particular context because I travel around, but I was down in Herefordshire last Sunday leading worship in two churches, one in Ledbury and one in Bromyard. And in um, Ledbury, they've opened a new church. They've closed their old church, which was too big, too unwieldy, too damp, too wet, too costly. They've gone into a smaller space with an upstairs with a lift, They've made conference rooms, and the congregation meet on Sunday uh, because they're happy, it's warm, it's clean, it's tidy, it's safe, and there's even people meeting upstairs simultaneously and online as well. And that's in a rural context, which has really stepped ahead of many of the bigger churches. Superb. Thanks, David. Anybody from the table? Just Oh, Nigel, go on, sorry. Yeah. um, I don't need to know the score. Yeah, I'm from from Litchfield, and we've got one service happening now we used to have three before covid so we used to have a 9:30, 9 o'clock 10 30 and 6 30 we're now just running a 10 o'clock service with 60 people hopefully when they turn up um, at the moment uh, and we're doing lots of talking about what we're going to do and what we're going to do going forward and we're looking at doing uh, different type services Table behind me. Anybody want to just share? Anybody? Ian, I'll let you share. That's a problem when you know somebody's name. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a church last Sunday where they said, apologetically almost, before COVID, we had more people in the church than we have now but they also have worship um, which is online they also have other types of worship as well so the church family is still worshiping but actually physically the numbers coming back into the congregation seem to be smaller and i've seen that in other places too Um, i think actually people are now choosing whether to meet in person or whether to meet in a more hybrid type of way but it doesn't mean that they're engaging any less in the life of the church and the circuit Mm. 
I think also one of the things we found, and, and whether you found this or not, I don't know, but certainly from a number of conversations I've had with different folk, uh, what, what lockdown has done has given them the chance to look at what else is out there uh, and have seen for the first time something other than their local church. Yeah. And for some, it's been eye-opening and kind of made, me go, made them go, why am, I, why am I here when there's all this out there and I can engage with lots of other places and lots of other Wishman communities and stuff that just is more inspiring sometimes than what they get in the local. So it is really interesting that, that where am I going to go back to or which community of faith am I going to engage with post this it has been eye-opening for a lot of people. And I know a number of folk have said, I'm not going back to where I was. I'm joining another community of faith because they fed me during lockdown and, and I've been able to engage with them. So there's a whole shift happening as well as the, the, yeah but i like your concept of high flex we'll come back well. to that in a minute because <laughs> uh, <laughs> i won't jump the gun there no no we will come uh, back to that i um, do think that with some of those worshiping communities people are choosing one week to worship physically one week to worship online and they're yeah. still part of that same community yeah absolutely yeah so okay simon that'd be great just from the uh, online, they said one of their churches there has moved forward, Zoomed the first week, and now they're back in the building, but they've discovered a new way of worshipping. Uh, rural churches are finding it quite difficult, uh, different problems, different understandings of God and different understandings of the Bible, but they are trying, someone else said they're trying a new midweek reflection service with Tazy Music and just started hybrid for the past two weeks. So it's from online, they're saying that there's a variety that they're doing yeah. going forward. Real mix. Um, we, I've been involved with um, a guy actually from this region, a guy named Jeff Bond, who is uh, the Learning Network coordinator for, the, for this particular area. Jeff and I have been planting a church together during lockdown, which has been an interesting journey. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend you plant a church during lockdown. It wasn't the easiest journey for us. Um, but we, um, we met, we started meeting in September 2020, and we met online, um, and we built a community of around 25 people who met with us every week online, uh, predominantly folk who were de-churched, folk who'd been involved with church. We, we, we actually knew quite a lot of them, so we'd invited them to come, and we knew they'd lost connection with church or not been to church for a long time, and we just kind of dropped them invites and said, come and join us. Uh, so our, our model for 12 months was really simple. Uh, we 11.15, we pre-recorded an act of worship, um, so it was just half an hour, and then at 12 o'clock, we met for a Zoom conversation uh, and time to talk, to reflect on the message, to pray together. So folk could either just watch worship or, and engage as they wanted to engage, or then engage in conversation with us. We built this community of around 25 who every... The actual as we all find with these things on Zoom, the minute you put something on Facebook, 3,000 people watch your, watch your clip. Uh, I'd love to be able to say we suddenly had a church of 3,000 people, but that's not reality. Um, numerous people watched what we put out every week in terms of content, but those that actually engaged with us that we would call our community of faith was about 25 who then chose to physically join us for conversation, for prayer, for discipleship, for nurture uh, every Sunday. And then we, so we still do that. That still happens every Sunday. Um, but we have added in a face-to-face -face worship context as well uh, as of this September. Uh, so we meet in this building in Leek. The building is a, it's a Methodist URC building. Um, it, URC owned, but it's a shared LEP building. So they meet in the morning at 10.30. There's about 80 of them that meet. It's fairly traditional in flavor. Um, and then we rent the space in the afternoon. Um, we literally are a renting body for them. We pay a rent and we go in at 3.15 for coffee and cake and then we worship together at 4 o'clock each Sunday. Uh, last Sunday was uh, our sixth Sunday and um, we hit 28 people, which is our kind of largest so far. So it's not massive by any uh, description, um, but for us it's a real... Um, what happened last Sunday for the first time was there were two groups a young family with one daughter and two parents and two older people who'd moved into Leek 10 days ago just turned up off the street because they'd seen something on Facebook and joined us for worship. Both of whom, uh, the, the ones who just moved into Leek obviously were connected to a church down south uh, but had moved and were looking for a church and found their way to us. The young family were a family, uh, uh, the, 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 the mother 
had not been in church for 10 years, but now had a daughter and wanted to reconnect with church. Uh, and so her and her partner and daughter found their way to us last Sunday. Uh, so we're beginning to get what, what's encouraging for us, folk from the community into the church with us. Um, but in terms of the church itself, we, we use the name the gathering. We don't use the word church um, because we're trying to, our language is trying to be really careful that the purpose of us gathering on a Sunday afternoon for coffee and cake, all homemade cake, the cake is great if you're ever in Leek on a Sunday afternoon. I don't make it. Somebody else makes it. Uh, but the coffee is great. Um, the language we're using is very much that actually what we do together for just an hour or so is actually not the most important part of the week. What we do together on a Sunday equips you to be the followers of Jesus. So we gather to equip you to be the followers of Jesus where you find yourself Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And so a key element of our worship, as I mentioned this morning, is something called TTT, which is this time tomorrow. And it's a good way for us to get to know our congregation members, uh, but also to see and hear what they're doing week in, week out, their day jobs, some fascinating stories I didn't know. People, I didn't know what they did on Monday, but to hear their journey and to be able to pray for them uh, and to offer, offer them and their life before God together as a community is really, really good. Uh, I, I'll move us on. So I threw out this morning just 10 conversation strands. They're coming from all over. These are gathered from a number of places, both from our own journey and, and others online who kind of are expressing uh, journey and trends that they are finding uh, coming out of the pandemic process. Um, so I'm going to throw these out and use these as a conversation. There are 10 and we have 20 minutes. So if you're good at maths, what you know is we've got about two minutes for each one of these for conversation. Uh, so I'll throw it out, maybe give a thought or two, uh, and then we'll see what, where, where these resonate with you as we journey forward. Uh, so I threw them out this morning, so you've had time to think about them over these last um, few hours. Being the church will become more important than going to church. Um, of course, what we do, either on Sunday or whatever day we do what we call church in the week, will always be important. Absolutely, it is important. The, the gathering, whether that be online or in person, hybrid or, or whatever language we might want to use in that context, will be important. The worship of God as a community of believers is important. So don't hear me say that that's not important. That is not what I'm saying. But actually, we've made that almost the be-all and end-all of everything that we do. We think that's it. Um, so many of our chapels, for example... You see a door open at 10.30 on a Sunday, but you never see it open any other time of the week. It's as if what we do on 10.30 on a Sunday is the be-all and end-all. This, this is it. This is the climax. Actually, that's not the climax. The climax is the lives lived out through the week. The making of disciples. The, the equipping of the disciples. The sending of the disciples out into God's world, wherever they're called and wherever they find themselves. So, of course, yes, we're going to gather in whatever form, however that might be. And that is shifting and changing, and rightly so. But, but actually, the being the church for us now becomes radically important. Moment to pause, just around your table, have a conversation. How does that resonate with you? Is that how you see things playing out? How does that work in your context? And maybe online you want to just share a couple of things in with us and we'll hear back in just a second. So there we go. And there was silence in the room. <laughs> now, Pete Phillips said you were talkers in this room this morning, so don't let me down now. <laughs> Hold on. Just talk about the tables and then we'll do it. Okay.
program and as I was saying, and there is really massive incident to rights. Well into felt some of these creatures houses in the day to the They weren't necessarily to reflect local language Okay, I'm gonna pull us back together. Anybody want to make a comment? You've got thirty seconds if you do. Nigel's got a microphone. I hope. Anybody want to make a comment? Okay. One down here. I, I think what you were saying about us, us being the church rather than the building is very important because um, as nice as these places are and wonderful as we, much as we love them, these places are not going to heaven. It's the people inside that are going to heaven. So basically... It's important that we be church in whatever form we are, and much more important that we put that in, in first place. Okay, and it, I'm guessing, Simon, if there's anything online, you'll just come and tell me as it comes in, so that's fine. Uh, let's move on. We're going to shoot on. Uh, secondly, new metrics of effectiveness will emerge. What I mean by this is the way we count... Um, whether we are, wrong phrase, successful, or doing well, or healthy, it needs to change. Historically, in a, particularly in a Methodist context, we, we filled in our October count, and, and we counted whoever turned up at 10.30 on a Sunday morning, and, and every year they were compared to the previous year's count, and, and if we'd gone up, we were healthy, and we were doing well. If we'd gone down, we added to the declining figures of Methodism. We subtly changed it in the last few years because we allowed uh, worship not to just be on a Sunday. We could count it to be on a Wednesday or a Thursday as well. That was, that was the subtle change we made towards changing patterns of life, worship, ministry. And, and effectiveness was counted purely on how many people attended or how many baptisms we'd done. Oh, and how many funerals we've done and weddings, that our effectiveness as Christian community was, was measured by those statistics. Actually, that, we've got to find new ways of measuring what it means to be faithful, uh, to be transformational, how we're engaging and connecting with communities. In the States, of course, in UMC, I don't know whether they still do this, Pete, you may know the answer, um, they used to have on their metrics forms um, professions of faith each year in their, in their statements. So every church had to put in, in, their, in their annual returns how many professions of faith they'd had in their congregation in this last 12 months. We don't put those on because we don't expect any. That's why they're not on ours. Um, well, that's kind of tongue-in-cheek. But, but every, every part of our language, certainly in my time as a Methodist minister, our language and our emphasis has been strategizing and planning for decline. We've, we've not expected growth. And suddenly, if we measure our life currently properly, our engagement, if we start to look at our digital footprint as communities of faith, we might start being surprised at how, uh, how effective we are in connecting beyond and certainly the stories of these last 18 months of churches that have suddenly realized there is a world beyond our 10.30 Sunday have, have connected well beyond their normal reach. We've got to find ways of measuring that. Find ways of measuring our engagement with others, our ways of engaging with community, our ways of engaging with transformation and change. Okay, let's, anyone want to comment? Do you want to talk around tables? Do you want to go straight in and just talk? talk? Which do you reckon, Trevor? Straight in. Okay. Val's going to speak. Hi. Um, every year, up until the pandemic, for the past 13 years, um, my local church has done a Christmas tree festival. Um, and it's... Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear now? Yeah. yeah. Um, for 13 years, we've done a Christmas tree festival. Um, partly, obviously, to raise funds. That's, that's always a, a Methodist way of going about things. But also, um, it's a way of getting people in um, at a time of year when people seem to want the church and hopefully they, they stay. Um, obviously, we haven't done it for two years. Now, we're going to do another one. We're going to try one this year. We have no idea how many people are going to be brave enough to come or want to come or whatever. But I will just say that last year, because we didn't do one, I did some posters of um, the Christmas story, uh, laminated them and all the rest of it, put quotes from the Bible on or verses from the hymn, and, um, and we put them on the railings outside. 
And as my husband and I were putting them on the railings outside, some people went past and said, oh, I bet you're not doing your Christmas tree festival this time. And I said, no, we can't do it. And, and they said, but this is wonderful. Everybody sees it, whether they um, come inside the building or not. We will miss your Christmas tree festival, but at least you're doing something. And to me, I couldn't, I couldn't remember ever seeing those two ladies, but they came to our tree, tree festival every year, apparently, um, and said it was the start of their Christmas. So how can we measure the fact that we've got through to two people that happened to walk past while I was putting these posters up and, and however many more people um, that, that, that it's touched? We don't know, do we? There's, there's, there's only one person that knows how many people we've touched, and that is God. And it was the same when I was a Sunday school teacher. If children would come through Sunday school, they would grow up, they would go to university. I wouldn't see them again because they'd stop wherever they were. And someone said to me, but the seed has been set, and you will never know the answer, but God will. <laughs> Thanks, Val. I'm going to move us on. We've got ten, ten minutes. We're due to finish at half past two. No, it's okay. I'm... Um, I'm just conscious of, of time. I want to try and just fly through and hear more what you've got to say. Churches, what well, this is. This is uh, Granny uh, Sucking Eggs business because you know this and you've seen this. This was well before pandemic. This was the process of where we were heading. Churches will become more communi community oriented. Uh, we'll be more focused uh, beyond our church walls. It'll be about our connections that we make. Um, we will flourish when we connect with our communities. I remember um, some years ago, I was walking from um, Methodist Church House uh, in Marylebone to, to Euston Station with a colleague. Um, and it was just at the point where uh, Swan Bank had, had grown, the church I was past of at that point had grown significantly. We'd gone from about 200 members to just over 400 members in about eight years. And um, my colleague said to me as we were walking, this was his question, I don't particularly like the tenor of the question, but the question was, well, what's the success of Swan Bank? Success isn't a word I particularly like, um, but I understand what he meant by the question. And um, it took me the whole journey from um, Methodist Church House to Houston to work out my answer, because I'd not thought about it in that particular way. And my answer was that, that I think the success or, or the church growth method that we used was simply that we were so connected to our community, embedded in everything around us, uh, the tentacles went out fully. I was given a lot of time to engage with community activity and projects that when anybody had an issue in that community, whether it was about feeding their children, clothing their children, bereavement, uh, just loneliness, whatever the question was, their first thought was, I'll go to Swan Bank. They will be able to help. Uh, the first thought wasn't Jesus, um, but they knew that there was a place that they could go to and would literally would put food on the table or clothes on their children or, or enable them to find uh, a, f a friend if they were lonely. Whatever the question was, or they were suddenly bereaved and didn't know what to do literally, they go to Swan Bank. And of course... You connect, you love, you care, and then community is built, and Christian community is built. And the Jesus bit comes in later down the line. But there's no shortcut to that. There's no quick fix to building community. There's no quick fix to building relationships beyond the walls of the church and out in, in the reach out that we need to do and the focus out that we need to do. There's no quick fix for that. It's long-term incarnational, loving community work. But you know that. I don't need to tell you that. Trevor, oh no, Simon, have the microphone. So from the online group, they've been having a big discussion around uh, rejoicing in daughters who are going great guns for the Lord and preaching and talk about their church, which did an app trial with the Christmas story and at Easter 2 around the town with different parts of the story illustrated and written. They're talking about different ways that they've been engaged in their community. Superb. Thanks, Simon. That's great. Healthy post-pandemic churches will welcome honest inquiry and dialogue. I think in authenticity. The, uh, one of the guys in, in our workshop this morning 
uh, talked about walking his dog. Uh, he, he was a Methodist minister, but he walked his, no, his local preacher, walked his dog on the same circuit every day and bumped into lots of people. What he's found during COVID is actually questions being asked that have never been asked before with faces and people he's seen for donkey's years suddenly have questions and we need to be creating those places for honest questions where the difficult questions the painful questions we talked this morning about trauma and, and, and issues actually we we will have people in our communities if we really engage with community who are carrying all kinds of pain and stories and therefore questions of God in the midst of that and we have to allow the question and the pain and the anger and the hurt to genuinely find its place within our life and not just do the we have all the answers and the answer is Jesus model. Now, we all know the answer is Jesus, ultimately. But actually, that's not a helpful engagement process with someone who's carrying a pain and needs to journey and be loved and feel that, feel that sense of, of value again. And, and, and the question has, has value in the midst. So um, healthy post-pandemic churches will welcome honest inquiry and dialogue. All kinds of people. The agnostic, the atheist, the, the conversations coming into the mix, creating community, uh, will be healthy. We've not got to be scared of question. Uh, I, I know um, I, I was an advocate of Alpha for many years, and Alpha always said, you know, we, any question is welcome. Well, I'm, I'm not actually sure it really was, if I'm really honest. Any question is welcome as long as it's on the topic we're talking about this week, and as long as I can answer you with the answer is Jesus, then we're all okay. Um, we, we need to allow that conversation to live within our communities um, and Jesus to infuse life and become part of that story. Anybody want to comment, question, or um, throw a response? David and then David. Oh, go for David there first and then there's David down here. David and David. The, the, the comment I have is in terms of transactional anal analysis, which is the parent-child, adult-adult yeah. relationship. For me, evangelism only really happens in an adult-adult relation, relationship. Too long, the church has worked in the transactional place of parent-child. Um, and actually, one of the dangers that we have is that many of our clergy are still trained in that model of parent-child yeah. in terms of... And, and actually, no, many of our congregations have been trained into that model of being the child and not being prepared to challenge parent rather than being allowed to be grown-up Christians. What you'll get, you've just really answered my final, my final point, which is fine, because uh, we've only got four minutes, we may not get to it anyway, so that's fine, you've done it. The, the final point I wanted to make right at the end was effective evangelism will become more relational and less transactional. It, it, it is about that genuine relationship rather than we've got an answer that we need to give to you. It, it is, absolutely. Um, rather than conversion just being that sense of I need you to come to think how I think. Uh, let's, let's live this walk together and let's see how that kind of flows for us. Um, helping people to adopt in a Methodist context, the Methodist way of life, the way of life of something, rather than just I can sign a piece of paper doctrinally or what. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Um, that's great. Thanks, uh, David. So we don't need to do the last point now. That's great because we've, we've covered it. Marvellous. David down here. Um. Something you said a few minutes ago resonated deeply because it's what I used to do and what I still do. Um, you said that you were given time to make links with community. Yeah. I think church members, church adherents, church friends don't realize how important that is. And many people here and listening online may be responsible for writing church profiles and stationing things. And it's our duty as church members, friends, adherents, etc., to challenge the system, to say, we want, when we write a new profile, to give our presbyter or deacon or lay worker more time in the community and less time with us. So we become less selfish as a church family to allow the presbyter or the deacon or the paid person or the, the, the prescribed person to be outside church walls more than historically we've enabled them to be. David, absolutely right. And we could have a whole conversation, couldn't we, about how much has been put on to a minister's desk connection, from the connection uh, that actually stops them doing what actually we felt called to when we answered a call from Jesus to, to ministry. And that's a whole, we, that balance has become 
uh, wrong somewhere, and we've got to redress that balance. If, if we're going to have healthy church doing what Jesus calls us to do, we've got to redress that balance. That's not to say those things are not important, but, but who is called to do that? And to actually look at the ministry of administration and to release the right people into those roles, because it may not be me. Well, the word administration and me don't often go in the same sentence, if I'm really honest. Uh, and my, my PA would say that's absolutely true. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the red tape that we've been given as yeah. people yeah. is just too much. And, and I know there's been all kinds of conversation around the decisions of the Methodist Conference around size of church, uh, which has been interesting to hear a little bit online and around the size 12. But actually, it can be the most releasing thing for a congregation. If you, if you have to think about how, how we share church with another body of people because actually that enables us to function you can release two or three congregations doing a whole load of stuff that actually they don't need to do and um, there are positives in that not just the negatives that we we see and hear a lot well the, some of us that argued for it to be higher that is correct but um let's let let's, the little winds are great david the little winds are great um trevor got his hand up It was really just one very quick comment, uh, actually following David, one comment about transactional analysis. And what we've discovered in Coffee Shop Sunday Online is a process of letting go of power empowers, yeah. if that makes sense. It, you give people responsibility that they want, or they don't feel maybe that they're uh, able to do things, but they are actually, and God empowers people. So... Where it ties in what, what you were saying is that we, why would we want to burden everything onto a minister when there are people able to take on responsibility? They just need given the opportunity. And what we found is that people who worry about leading a session of prayer, for instance, suddenly flourish and discover talents that they didn't know they had. But what's happened is they've been given the opportunity. So we've got to take some risks and just let people get on with it. Thanks, Trevor. That's great. Um, here's the word I used this morning. That some people said, what does that word mean? Uh, the high flex word. Um, Peter, is this a word you've started using around? No, has, has it not come to you from anywhere? Since this came from the University of Manchester to us, uh, from, from, uh, from our, our link in the University of Manchester. They've started using this word high flex in terms of their own teaching elements of stuff. But actually, I think it works within our context as well, because what, what, what Manchester said to us, we need is to, to create a high flex model of teaching for, for our college. So we need to recognize it isn't just about for our teaching, either on site or online. It has to be absolutely flexible for every student to access either on site or online, whichever way they want to do it, whenever they want to do it, at the drop of a hat, or actually you may need to close down the on site to become just online, or actually what we're now talking of course is in a global context, uh, folk may want to do part of their course remotely, part of their course online, and there has to be flexibility to allow all that happen. So they saw hybrid, and, and we can have a whole debate over this actually, it might be really helpful, they saw hybrid as quite kind of un unhelpful in the sense of it, it, it sounds like it's just either on site or online. Um, they wanted to use the word high flex because it, it gives this sense of flexibility. But I think as we emerge from pandemic and, and as we embrace uh, the digital world more fully uh, and, and social media world more fully, there will be that flexibility of people moving between the on-site and the online world, and how do we create community between those two with a genuine sense of movement? So some Sundays your congregation member may be on-site, some Sundays they may be uh, in person, some Sundays they may be somewhere else, uh, being flexible to, to actually worship in another context. We talked earlier on about, actually I've had my eyes opened to something new, and maybe some Sundays I want to go and visit somewhere else, because... I can do that online now and I can go to anywhere in the world and I can join in a worship experience. And so that whole flexibility of what does it mean to be this community is a shift. I wonder, Pete, whether you want to comment. It might be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, the problem I have with high flex or the models that are coming out about that is that it's, it's feeding into consumer culture and saying actually it's about the individualized 
It's about individuated study and individuated study plans. Well, actually, learning is a community thing. And so how, do you, how can you be super flexible or hyper flexible about getting a community to do that? And, and then, so you can't really flip that onto church easily because you end up with a kind of distributed church too quickly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and everybody's, it's kind of pop in to have communion wherever you want and have asynchronous communion or, you know, have it online this week and have it in person the next week and so on, or in, on site next week. And, and I just don't, I, there has to be some intentionality about a learning community and, and others. So, so, so I think with the digital, digital theology module, we encourage students to turn up for a block teaching week, but then we put everything onto Signal. Um, and we have a signal training group. And we're talking about it at the moment. We're talking about the, the webinars and what, what was happening this afternoon, everything on signal. Because, you know, Simon's one of our students and he's in there doing the tech. Yep. And, and so he's sharing about what's happening. So, so the learning community needs to form and then be flexible across different patterns. So how, does, how, how, does, that, how does that work then faith community-wise? I think it's just the same. It's the whole thing. I mean, the, the students talk about this that model being a, a form of spiritual development themselves because what they're finding is that they get to know their community, they get to know the church, the, 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 the learning community they're in, and then they can flexible and put, put points in. But it's, I think that can flip into a church if you then say, well, let's form that community, let's allow that community to develop in a you know, hot house experience or whatever, and then be flexible, see how you can have prayer chains through WhatsApp, you know, how do you use Lecture 365 in another chat prayer chain, lots of different things, how do you do different group work and social activities, um, social justice activities through various on-site groups. So I see the flexibility, but I'm just kind yeah. of, I'm, no, worried no, about the, I'm worried about the kind of consumer operation. The individualism, yeah. And that. Yeah. I, I do wonder whether there is a sense we're going to, we are picking up that... Uh, one of the downsides of COVID, downside is probably the wrong word, um, has been we have become very individual. By network, because we've had to be. Socially, we've been locked, haven't we, in literally in a small bubble, uh, whether that be a family bubble or even for many of us, on our, literally on our own. So we've had that sense of, like, I, I need to find my, my life. I need to find my Christian community, because some of us, the church I've been a part of has done nothing. I've had to find another church to enable me to do that. So communities suddenly become fluid a bit more than... So to get that intentionality back is not always easy once we've lost it from the individual perspective. Is that fair? Is that fair? Okay, Nigel. Just... I was just going to go on, but, but I think one of the things we need to take from it is we do need to be flexible. Hmm. Um, one of the things we did with our youth group, we, we, we went on Zoom from straight off, went really well. We managed to keep going, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, but we did keep going. Then we came out of lockdown and we started meeting together. But we had to be flexible that we could go back on Zoom because we had two of ours get COVID. And it was like, well, now we can't meet again because they couldn't meet. So we went straight back onto Zoom. And we can now do that because we've all done it. And it's about that we are now or now can be flexible that we can flex between both, especially with our youth group. And if we can do it with the youth group, we can do it with the church. I'm conscious we've run out of time, so I am going to stop. The other comments we were going to talk about were about uh, the church becoming smaller, intentionally smaller, in terms of its numbers and gathering sizes, and we could have had a conversation. Surprising partnerships, uh, new partnerships in community will engage, um, and the final one would have been the gospel is still good news. The gospel is still good news. Jesus is still the hope of the world. Um, we just need to find our way through this period uh, and rem remember, in the midst of all... The gospel is still good news, and we still have something to share. We just need to find some new, creative, uh, digital, fun ways of doing it as we emerge out. Anybody want to make a final comment? Because I'm conscious I've gone seven or eight minutes over time. No? Then I will shut up and sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs>